in, in Ukraine and other places around the world where they are not allowed to worship or their worship is, uh, you know, taking a risk on being killed or whatever. And we come to America and we have the freedom to be here and to gather together. And we praise the Lord for that. And it's just good to know this morning that we have a personal relationship with Jesus. And because of that, we want to lift up his voice. So let's all stand together this morning. Lift up your voice and sing hallelujah. Jesus the Christ will ever reign. Lift up your voice and sing hallelujah. Hallelujah to the King. Lift up your voice and sing hallelujah. Jesus the Christ will ever reign. Lift up your voice and sing hallelujah. the King. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lift up your voice and sing of His praise. He is our Lord, He is our King, Almighty Prince of Peace is He. Lift up your voice and sing Alleluia. Jesus the Christ will ever reign. Lift up your voice and sing Alleluia, Alleluia to the King. The glory of the Lord shall fill the whole earth. The hope of glory is Christ in us. All of the world shall see that He reigns. He is our Lord, He is our King. Almighty Prince of Peace is He. Lift up your voice and sing Alleluia. Jesus the Christ will ever reign. Lift up your voice and sing Alleluia. Alleluia to the King. Alleluia to the King. So whether it's a good day or a bad day, good things happening, bad things happening, we should still give our praise and our glory to the Lord. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to His name. Glory to His name, glory to His name, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to His name. I am so wondrously saved from sin, Jesus so sadly abides within there at the cross where he took me in, glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name, glory to his name. Amen. Amen. I hear some little voices making big noise. I love it. Praise the Lord. I exalt thee, Lord. Thou art exalted, Father. 
salvation and to know the Lord loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us to give us life forever for eternity and then how can we not look at him and look what he does in our lives and and not stand with all but it also should give us another challenge it should give us a decision or bring us to a decision of wanting to do what he wants us to do and this little song says I have decided to follow Jesus Decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Should no one join me? Just bow our hearts before the Lord for a second. 
Before I pray, I want to ask you the question. Would you say that is your commitment? The world's behind me. I'm not worried about what people think. I'm not worried about what people want me to do or what the world is trying to draw me into. Um, I work because I need to, not because I'm trying to achieve something. Uh, I, I live my life as an example uh, to, to my family, to others, because I love Jesus. The world's behind me, and I'm running towards Calvary. I'm running towards the cross. I'm running towards Jesus. And if that's who you are today, uh, then praise God. But if you realize every day, as I do, when I wake up, that's a brand new challenge. Then may you just pray with me this morning and say, Lord, I want my testimony to be the cross is before me and the world is behind me. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Forgive us, Lord, when we have those things mixed up. We know the cross. We understand our salvation. We understand we have a relationship with you for eternity, and we're thankful for that. But we are so caught up in life, in the world. And, Lord, may we rearrange that. Put you in front. Make you the priority and that we can actually sing from the bottom of our heart the world behind me, the cross before me. Open your word to us this morning. Change us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your copy of the Word of God, turn to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to finish Matthew 25 today. And beginning in verse uh, chapter 26 through to the end of the book, we are going to be talking about uh, Easter. Amazing, we got here right at the right time, right? I want you to know, as brilliant as I am, I did not plan this. So, uh, and I used the brilliant... Uh, it, only because the light reflects off my bald head. Uh, not because I'm smart, because that's obviously not true. Um, in chapters 24 and chapter 25, this, this is Tuesday in the week leading up to Easter, uh, to, or to the death of Christ. This is Tuesday, and it's what we've been referring to as the Mount Olivet Discourse. Jesus on Monday was in Jerusalem, and he left it rip and told those guys, yeah, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the whole bunch of them, how corrupt they were, how wrong they were, uh, how lost they were. Can you imagine being told how lost you are when you think you've got, the, you've got it all figured out? You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> over the years of driving, I have uh, more than once uh, had someone get me lost, and I've more than once got myself lost. Uh, but there was nothing like the time I got lost by a cop uh, in uh, Montreal, Canada. And that's a story for another day. Uh, but uh, he thought he knew where he was going. And I, just let me give you a little quick version here. He thought he knew where he was going. And at one point, he pulled over a taxi cab and asked him where I was going. That's true. That's a true story. Uh, I'll share that with you another day. But... So these guys, the scribes, Pharisees, they all, they're spiritual, they're religious. Now, let me back up. They're not spiritual. They're religious. They think they're spiritual. And Jesus comes in on Monday, and he just lets it rip and says, you're all a bunch of corrupt people. He calls them hypocrites. And it would be one thing if he said, you all are a bunch of <laughs> And they couldn't really hear him, but he tells them multiple times that they're hypocrites. You know, it's one thing when somebody says you're stupid, but when they just keep telling you you're stupid, you know. Trying to make sure that you get the message. So then he leaves Jerusalem on Monday, and he's walking <clears throat> out towards Bethany, and they come to the Mount of Olives. This is so important because as we get in our study today, you'll see why the Mount of Olives is important. But they come to the Mount of Olives, and they go up onto the Mount of Olives, and they're sitting there, and they're having this, what is, uh, scholars refer to as the Mount Olive Discourse. And so he start, he's speaking to them, uh, and he's telling the, the, his disciples about what's going to happen, verse chapter 24 and chapter 25, and I've tried to make this clear every service. 
He's telling them what's going to happen before his second coming. Second coming. We, I hope you understand by now that the rapture of the church and the second coming are not the same thing. Okay, I've tried to make that emphasis. I've put a chart up on the wall each week for you. I'm not doing that this morning. But uh, 20, 24 and 25, he said, this is what's going to happen before I return, when I come back physically. The first coming of Christ, he came in a manger physically. Second coming of Christ, he's coming down at the Mount of Olives. I'll give you a little bit of a head start here. At the Mount of Olives, he's coming back to that place. It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. And uh, so he's telling them this is what's going to happen. Last week, he talked about in the earlier part of chapter 25 with the parables of the ten uh, virgins and the parables of the talents. He talked about the Jews that were going to be there at the end of the tribulation. They have served seven years in the tribulation. Three and a half, the Bible tells us, is very, very extremely bad. The last three and a half says uh, it's a uh, time like no other before and no other will ever happen. And they've made it through the, the tribulation, and he talks about them. Then we come over here in chapter 25, beginning of verse 31, and down through the end of the chapter, and he's talking about the judgment of the Gentiles. These are the people that are non-Jews, obviously, that have lived through the tribulation. <clears throat> and, uh, and the Lord says to his followers, this is what the picture is going to look like. So let's pick up. At verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, and then he will sit on his glorious throne. See, that tells us right there this is not the rapture, because the rapture, he catches us up to meet him in the air, not on his throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, talking about the Gentile nations, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the, of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food, and I was thirsty, and you gave me drink, and I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we do all that stuff? <clears throat> And he says in verse 40, and the king will say, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, the goats, depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, he goes through the whole list again, and he said, and you did not, you did not feed me, you did not clothe me, you did not take care of me, you did not comfort me, you did not visit me. Verse 44, and they said, wait a minute, when was that? And he says in verse 45, Truly I say to you, as you did not do to one of, of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And then he says, And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. Now we're going to go back and begin in verse 31. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're going to talk about the non-Jewish tribulation survivors. And they will, number one, see Jesus as king. Verse 31 tells us very clearly that when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. They will see Jesus as king. Okay? We find all through Scripture stories or, or statements in Scripture that tell us about Jesus being king. And <clears throat> people try to speculate when that's going to be. We know it's going to be in the millennial reign of Christ when he is set on the throne and he is there as he should have been, as he always should have been, except the sin in the world has kept him away from there. So the first thing the non-Jewish tribulation survivors will see is Jesus as king. Verse 32 tells us that the Jewish tribulation survivors will be, uh, or excuse me, the non-Jewish tribulation survivors will be judged personally. Judge personally. Look at verse 32. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as shepherds separates the sheep from the goats. Now, the word nation here is not referring to countries. It's not saying, you know, America and Canada and Mexico, and, and that's not what it's saying. It's talking about all nationalities. People will come and stand before him. <clears throat> in fact, over in the Old Testament, Joel chapter 3 talks a little bit about this in a couple places. He says there, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there 
on behalf of my people and my heritage, Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided them up and have divided up my land. Let the nations stir themselves up and bring and, and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Joel writes that. So the Bible tells us that the Lord says they're going to come. They're going to come and to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Well, if you get out a map and you look up the Valley of Jehoshaphat, you won't find it. Nobody really knows where it is. In fact, uh, scholars have debated for a long time. But some believe, and I, I'm just telling you what they, what, they, what they believe. I'm not saying it's right or wrong because I don't personally know. But when the Bible tells us in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4, let me read that to you and then I'll tell you what some believe about the Valley of Jehoshaphat. On that day, his feet, Jesus, shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and one half of the mount, mount move southward. So if some scholars teach that that valley is going to be the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, we don't know that for sure, but we just know that that's going to happen. The Bible says so. When Jesus comes back on the Mount of Olives and his feet touch that ground, that Mount of Olives is going to split in two and there's going to be a valley there. Now, it's interesting because the word Jehoshaphat, the valley of Jehoshaphat, means the Lord judges. That's what it means. And so when the Lord returns, he's coming back. He's already taken the church. We talked about that in the rapture. And when he returns, he's coming back to judge. And so they're going to be judged personally, each person. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the non-Jewish tribulation survivors will be separated. Look at verse 33. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Now, sheep often in, Bible, in the Bible refers to, to believers, those who are Christ followers. And goats often uh, represent the lost. And in this case, that's exactly what it represents. Uh, these are people that are rebellious. They've had the opportunity to come to Christ. They've had the opportunity to surrender to him, but they have chosen to ignore the call of God. They've, they've, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to know that. I don't want to whatever. And so they're going to be separated. Now, beginning at verse 34 down through verse 40, <clears throat> we see the invitation to the sheep. The invitation to the sheep. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are the people that were saved during the tribulation. These are the people that got saved during the tribulation. Now, we talked the other, last week, I think it was a little bit, about there's going to be 144 witnesses out there. And, and of course, uh, the, the two prophets are going to be there witnessing. So there's going to be the message of the Lord. I've heard people teach that during the tribulation, there will be no spirit, the Holy Spirit will not be present. That's not true. Because the Holy Spirit is needed for you to come to Christ. So the Holy Spirit's going to be acting and working. It's just that the people aren't going to want to hear what he has to say. So he gives the invitation to the sheep here in verses 30 through, 34 through 40. Let's look at verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And so, first of all, Letter A, they're going to come into the kingdom of God. This has been planned out. This is what the Lord has prepared since, uh, since creation, the Bible says. And so uh, this is not nothing new to God. And he is calling those who are, have turned to him to come to him. So then he gives in verse 35 and 36 the reason for their invitation. And he says, when I was hungry... Uh, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. And when I was a stranger, you welcomed me. And when I was naked, you clothed me. And when I was sick, uh, you visited uh, and you visited me. I was in prison. You came to me. It's interesting, by the way, that Paul uh, often speaks about this should be our behavior as followers of Christ. We should go to the people that are in prison. We should go to the sick. We should go. You know, we, that's, that's our job is to help other people. One of the ladies I had in the hospital as a nurse said to me, I could have retired. I, she goes, I'm retiring in two years, and then I'm going to volunteer, is what she told me. And I could have already retired. But when the pandemic hit, I just thought because of my knowledge and skill, I needed to serve people. See, as Christians, we have the knowledge. We have the king. We need to make difference in people's lives. 
But that's a side message. So he says here, this is the reason for your invitation. When I, all this happened, you came to me, you fed me, you provided food, you provided me drink, you provided me clothing, and you provided care. Now, Jesus was not referring to himself personally. He was not referring to himself personally. He's referring to his people, the Jews. Now, I need to just give you a little bit of reminder in case you missed it in the past couple weeks. When, when the tribulation happens, we have three and a half years of fairly order in peace. Now, what's going to happen is, of course, Satan in his power is going to put a person on the throne to be in charge of the whole world. There's going to be a leader of the whole world. Uh, you know, I, I still go back to George Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush, and I think about his statement early in his presidency where he said about the new world order. And I remember how that scared me. Not fearfully scared, but just like, boom, we're getting closer type, you know, understanding. And here we are as a nation, you know, becoming part of this. And, of course, we have become part of that. There's going to be a one-world government, one-world leader who's going to be in charge. And for the first three and a half years, he's going to protect the Jews, so to speak. And he's going to have a, the Bible says he's going to have a treaty with the Jews. And the Jews are going to be happy thinking, wow, this is cool. Everything's good, but whatever, whatever. The second three and a half years, the Bible calls it the abomination of desolation. Those are not really words that we use about anything. You don't look out the window and say, look at that, whatever, it's abomination of desolation. Uh, the Bible uses them because it is a time that will be never, has never happened before. And you can go back and start thinking about the atrocities and the catastrophes that we've had in our world. And this is going to be far worse, okay? And it says it will never happen again. And so the three and a half years, the second, that world leader is going to revoke his, his uh, friendship and his uh, peace treaty with Israel. And at that point, they're going to go after Israel with a vengeance. I'm talking not only the country of Israel, but the people of God. And they're going to do everything they can to eradicate them from the face of the earth. Now, it's interesting because we had a guy that did that back in the 40s. Remember that guy? Okay, and we know how many millions of people died for no apparent reason. And yet, this the same thing is going to take place. Uh, it's interesting. You know, I've had people say to me, why does the people in the world hate the Jews so much? Because they hate God. They are God's people. And if there's anybody in the whole world that should be helping the Jews and encouraging the Jews and praying for the Jews, it should be us, the body of Christ. We should be praying for them. We should be encouraging them. We should be helping them. And so uh, the Lord says that during the, especially the last three and a half years of tribulation, when my people are being slaughtered and chased and they have no way to survive because they did not take the mark of the beast. Remember that? If they take the mark of the beast, we talked about that. If you take the mark of the beast, then, then you cannot be a child of God. And the Bible says that if you don't take the mark of the beast, you're not going to buy and sell, and you're not going to get food, and you're not going to have a place to live. And so these people that survive the tribulation, that stand for God, first of all, are not going to be millions and billions of them, I don't think. The Bible says there's going to be a big number, but we don't really know what that number is. But these people are going to be scrambling every day to survive. I don't mean like looking for food, although that's going to be part of it. They're going to scramble every day to survive just to keep from being killed. They're going to, they're going to live in caves. They're going to live in places. They're just trying to survive. And so the Bible says here that the, Jew, the Jews going through this, those who are not Jewish to help them, that assist them. He gives a whole list here. He says, you know, uh, when they were hungry, you fed them. Thirsty, you gave them to drink. When you saw that they were a stranger, you walked on them. When they didn't have clothing, you gave it to them. He said, when they were sick, you helped them. And when they were in prison, you visited them. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Let's just pretend. By the way, the good news is that starting a week from tomorrow, we are allowed back in the jail. So we get to do our ministry in the jail again. So that's a praise. Praise God for all those who've been praying. But let, let's assume that you are locked up, you're incarcerated because you're a Jew, and the only thing next on your list of things to come during the tribulation is going to be death, and yet a Gentile comes to visit you. Where does that put you in the position as a Gentile? You're equal with them. They hate you too. 
They're going to kill you. And so the Lord says here, you get your invitation to come into my kingdom because this is what you did. Now, before we go any further, I don't want anybody to get the idea that this is, a, this is salvation by works. Because there's no place in Scripture, in all 66 books, there isn't any place in Scripture that says you can get to heaven by doing something. That's not what this is. These people have not taken the mark of the beast. They have chosen to surrender to God. They're Christians, but they have gone further because in being a Christ follower, they have chosen to do these things for the Jews. Look at verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we feed you? And when did you get, we give you a drink? And when did we see you as a stranger welcome you? And when did we you're naked that we clothed you? And when did you see the sick or in the prison, and when we come to you, and Jesus, verse 40, answered them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least, look at the words, these my brothers, and actually the terminology there is not a sex, it's, it's brother and sister, okay? It's both, brothers and sisters, just as you have done it to another one of my children, my chosen Jewish people, the Lord said, you might as well have done it to me. That's what he says right here. I'm not making these up. It's right here. It's right here in Scripture. So these are the Jews that have been through this great distress. They've been through this great trouble during the tribulation. The world leader has tried everything he could to exterminate them. And the Lord said, the reason that you get an invitation is because when they were hurting the most, you reached out to them. When they were struggling the most, you, you touched them. The Bible tells us over in Revelation 12, 17, it gives us a little bit of a picture of this. I want you to look at, listen to what I read you. You can look at it another time. The dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan, okay? The dragon became furious with the woman. The woman represented here is the Jews. And went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on, these, uh, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. This is during the tribulation, Revelation 12. It was during the tribulation, and it says very clearly here that Satan said, anyone, especially the Jews, who have kept, right here in verse 17 of, of Revelation, have held on to the testimony of Christ, I'm going to kill them. I'm taking them out. You think the devil bothers you? This is nothing like today. Well, this is going to be. Your worst day of Satan messing with you isn't like this. And so the Gentiles here, they help the Jews during the tribulation. And they put their own life in jeopardy. And the Lord gives them the answer. He says, you know, come into my kingdom. His, their works didn't save them, but their works proved who they were. You know, it's interesting in Romans, Paul wrote, that you don't get to heaven by works because if we got to heaven by works, we would boast. We'd be bragging about it. Look what I did. Look what I did. The Bible says that's not true. You go to the book of James. James says if you're a follower of Christ, your works will show that you're a follower of Christ. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. If you're a follower of Christ, you're going to feed, you're going to help. During the tribulation, those who are here are going to reach out to the Jews that are here as well, that have not taken the mark of the beast. Now he goes on. He doesn't finish here. In verses 41 through 46, he talks about the judgment of the goats or those on the left. Okay? Those on the left that he's talking here about are the ones that are not saved. They're, not the, they're the ones that have taken the mark of the beast. They're the ones that have surrendered to the evil one. So he says here in verse 41... Then he will say to those on the left, the goats, from verse 33. He, he showed right there in verse 33 who they were. Depart from me. Depart from my kingdom. And he says, you're cursed in the eternal fire, prepared. And I want you to notice this. And if you like one of those people that write in your Bible, mark this. Prepared. And we see there who hell is prepared for. He makes it very clear. He says, hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. The devil and his angels. But he sends people there because they have chosen to follow the devil. They have not surrendered to Jesus. They have chose to follow the devil. And he says, depart from me into eternal fire. And we're going to talk more about that in just a minute. 
internal fire, not prepared for people, but for the devil and his angels. But you're going there because you chose to follow him. A number of years ago, there was a truck driver going down 81, down towards, uh, down below uh, Frackville, down that way. And if you've ever traveled that road, it's one of the worst interstates in all of Pennsylvania, as far as, well, Pennsylvania interstates are terrible anyhow, but uh, because of potholes. But, but anyway, uh, that's bad because of the weather down there. In the wintertime, it snows there. When it doesn't snow anyplace else, you get those squalls, you get those whiteouts, all that. But it also gets very, very, very foggy at times. And so there's a truck going down the road, and he's traveling down there. And right before he gets to the Higgins exit, he's traveling along fine. And there's another truck behind him that has no clue because he can't see a doggone thing, and he's following the truck ahead of him. And the truck ahead of him gets into the heavy fog, and he can't see, and he runs off the road into the woods. And the truck behind runs off the road into the woods because he was just following along. And, you know, that's exactly what happens here. People who choose not to follow Christ follow Satan, and he leads them right straight into the front door of hell. And Jesus says here, he pronounces judgment upon them because they have aligned with Satan and his angels. In fact, if you go back and study scripture, you'll see that when Satan was cast out of heaven, he took one third of the angels with him because they followed him. You better be very, very careful who you're following. That little chorus at the end, the world behind me, the cross before me. That should be our goal. Verse 42 through 45, for I was hungry. He goes over the whole list again. You gave me no food. I was thirsty. You did not give me a drink. I was a stranger. You did not welcome me. I was naked. You didn't give me clothes. I was sick and in prison. You did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when, when did all this happen? Verse 45, then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, the tribulation Jews, you did not do it to me. So Jesus proclaims their failure. This is your failure. He lays it out for them. See, the goats chose not to extend mercy to the remnant of the Jews during the tribulation. They just didn't do it. They, they, they were too worried about themselves. They were really unconcerned. In fact, the evidence that Jesus pronounces here is evidence of unconcern. It's interesting, folks. I don't know if you ever think about it, but when you fail to endorse something, even when you fail to acknowledge truth, you're siding with the people who call it a lie. When you fail to speak about lies, you're siding with those people. You're giving into that. And here during uh, this time, these people have failed to do anything that would endorse God's people and instead endorsed Satan's work against God's people. And the Lord lays out the judgment right there before him. Verse 46. And these, who the lost, will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Jesus pronounces eternal judgment. That's a good verse to underline in your Bible because there's people that believe that when you, if you're not a Christian, when you die, you're just dead. Or you might have to go to hell for a little bit, but then you'll burn up and that'll be over with. But Jesus says in verse 46, there's eternal life that brings eternal punishment and there's eternal life that brings eternal blessing. I have news for you this morning. It's not good news. It's just news. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, when you die, you go to hell for eternity. And you never get out. The good news is if you know Christ as your Savior, when you die, hallelujah, you go to be with Jesus, and you never want to get out. Amen. I've joked around about the fact that people, when they pass, you know, there's not, nobody. If you were to call up anybody you know that, that's a believer that died, and you were to call them up today and ask them, hey, just wondering, do you want to come back to, to earth for a day? They're going to tell you to drop dead. Nobody wants to. That, why would you do that? That would be like dumb, okay? So let's put a couple things down this morning about us. Things for us to learn from this text. I mean, I know it talks about, if you know Christ today, 
And my understanding of Scripture is that we will not go through the tribulation. We will not be going through this struggle. Uh, if you don't know Christ today, you're going to be in that struggle. And I would encourage you this morning to come to Jesus. But I want you to know a few things that still stand out that even though we're going to miss the tribulation, they're still true. Number one, there will be a judgment. Uh, there'll be a day of judgment. There'll be a day of judgment. Romans 3.19 tells us the whole world may be held accountable to God. There's going to be a day of judgment. I don't care who you are. We're all going to be accountable before God. Let me just give you a couple things real quick. First of all, the saved are going to be held accountable before God. 2 Corinthians tells us each one may receive what is due for what he has done in body, whether good or evil. Makes you feel good, doesn't it? No. Because you know you already got a pile of garbage in your life, right? The good news is, Jesus, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so if you've got a whole mess of junk you don't want to have to stand before Jesus for, it's time to dump it. Get rid of it. Go to Jesus. Say, here it is. Don't go to Jesus and say, oh, Lord, I know I have a lot of sin, and so take care of it. That's not going to work. You need to go to Jesus and say, this is my sin. And I choose not to do that anymore. I want you to forgive me. I want you to help me not do it anymore. There'll be a day of judgment for the lost. Matthew 7. We studied this already. Jesus said, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many, many works in your name? Verse 23, I tell you, this is like the saddest scripture in all of the Bible. Then Jesus will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. He said, you know, just because you have done things in my name, just because you talk about my name, just because you carry around the Bible with you and show it to people, because you wear the right T-shirt, because you go to church every Sunday, it doesn't cut it. It doesn't get it done. And that's not, you say, well, Pastor, that's, that's not really nice that you tell us these things. No, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. The lost is going to hear those words. If you don't know Jesus, you're going to hear the saddest words when you hear, depart from me. And, you know, the, the interesting thing is we can all stand before Jesus and, and say, well, I, you know, I gave money to the roof fund. I supported a missionary all my life. My parents supported, supported missionaries from the day they got saved until the day they went to be with Jesus. But I got to tell you something. When they got to heaven, the Lord didn't say, welcome in, you supported a missionary. When they got to heaven, he said, welcome in because you gave your life to Jesus Christ. He's your Savior. The lost are going to stand before the Lord and hear those words, depart from me, I never knew you. Thirdly, the nations were judged in the past and they will be in the future. If we think for any reason that the nations that stood against Israel in the past that got judged, and you can look at the history of, of the world and see how many nations that did things to Israel got judged, if you think for a moment that God is going to let the nations of today's uh, slide, you're dead wrong. 1 Corinthians tells us these things happen to them as an example. He said they happened as an example. He said now, but they were written down, Paul says, for your instruction. What Paul was saying is you need to learn from history because we already know he who doesn't learn from history is, is bound to repeat it. And Paul says it was, it was an example, and it was written down so you would have instruction so you would not do that. There will be a day of judgment. Number two, eternal places are prepared. Eternal places are prepared. You say, well, you know, I like that fuzzy preaching where, you know, everybody goes to heaven. That's not preaching. That's somebody lying to you because the Bible doesn't say everybody goes to heaven. In fact, the Bible says only those who surrender their life goes to Jesus goes to heaven. There's going to be far less people in heaven than everybody thinks. Because a lot of people go through the motions but have not really given their life to Christ. So he says here there's eternal places prepared, first of all, for the saved. That's for everyone in the room, everyone watching online, everyone that you know, everyone that's died, everyone that's living. That's for everybody who has come to Jesus as Savior. 
First John says, this is a promise that he made to us. I like this verse. This is the promise he made to us. And then two words, eternal life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember John? John was the, 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 the disciple who uh, had a special place, a special relationship with Jesus. In fact, John refers to himself often in his writing as the disciple that Jesus loved. And he says, hey, I just got to tell you about this promise. This promise that the Lord gave to us, eternal life. Yes! Oh, nobody's excited? I am. You heard about the little kid, right? They were sitting in the Sunday school, or Sunday school class, and the teacher said, how many of you all want to go to heaven? And everybody in the class raised their hand except one little kid, little Johnny. And she goes back to Johnny, and she said, Johnny, don't you want to go to heaven? He goes, yeah. She said, why didn't you raise your hand? He said, I thought you were getting up a load right now. You guys are dead. I hope that's not your spiritual relationship. 2 Timothy 4.18, Paul says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. For the saved, as promised. For the lost, verse 41, Jesus said, Depart from me, you cursed, into eternal, life, into eternal, eternal, eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I already told you, it's not, it was never made for man. It was made for Satan. Verse, uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 29, Jesus said, Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal sin or eternal damnation is what that means. So who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit? The blasphemer against the Holy Spirit is not, the, is not, everybody listen, is not the person who's been divorced. Okay? It's not. I've heard that, I've heard people teach that. Well, if you're a divorcee, you blaspheme, no, 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 no. That's, that's dead wrong. That's, you, you know what, folks? If we're going to say things, make sure you can prove them by the Scripture. Amen? That's wrong. That's not in the Bible anywhere. Or those who have done this or said that or murdered somebody or, or, or committed suicide. If you commit suicide, you black. No, that's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is those who have looked the Holy Spirit in his face and said, I don't want you in my life. The one who has rejected Jesus as Savior is the blasphemer of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says in Mark that that person uh, has no, no, no eternal life. He has eternal damnation. Let me give you a quick uh, description of eternal damnation according to the scriptures. First of all, in verse 41 we read today, that is a place to, uh, designed for the devil and his angels and it has everlasting fire. Everlasting fire. The description of this, the picture that Jesus used often was the dump outside of Jerusalem where they would take their trash outside of Jerusalem and dump it on the dump, but the dump burned continually because people were always putting trash on the garbage. That was the kind of the picture, eternal fire. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20, and you can write them down, look them up if you want to, verses 10 and verse 14, it tells us that it's, it's, a, uh, it's the, a lake of fire and brimstone. Fire and brimstone, not, not the kind of place you want to live. Where do you live? I live over there in that street with all the fire and brimstone. Just put yourself uh, for a thought process near a volcano. Nobody would want to live there. The Bible tells us in Revelation 21, 8, it's the second death. Not meaning you're going to die. It doesn't mean you're going to die physically. You're going to die, but spiritually you're not going to die. But you're going to be separated from God. Spiritual death is separation from God. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15 says, It's a place for all those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. If your name isn't there. That's where you live, the lost. Verse 46 tells us the next one is for eternity. Eternity. None of you know how long eternity is. Some of you lived a long time. You might think it's an eternity. We were having a discussion yesterday at men's breakfast about who was the oldest. Lonnie won. Anyway, but he has not lived for eternity. There's times when he thinks his life is in eternity. 
because so do you and I. Am I right? No. Yes, I'm right. But look what it says in verse 36, or 46. The lost will go away into eternal punishment. Eternal punishment. The righteous will live in eternal life. I'll take the life. Amen? Luke 16 and verse 26. Luke wrote, between heaven and hell. He, he said there's a great chasm. He's telling the story about the rich man and Lazarus. He said between heaven and hell, between uh, the rich man and Lazarus, which represent the two different places. He said there's a great gulf fixed. Great space fix, a great uh, partition put there because there are people that would want to cross over, but they cannot. Eternity. I don't know how long eternity is, but I'm telling you this right now, for the 65 years I've lived on this earth, even if I only have to live 65 more in heaven, which isn't true because that's not eternity, I want to make sure I'm in heaven with Jesus. Number three, are you ready? Are you ready? Let me give you three things. First of all, do you know Jesus as your Savior? A number of years ago, at the end of a service, somebody came to the door and shook my hand and said to me, I just want you to know that I know Jesus as my Savior. I'm ready to meet him because if you have to do my funeral, I want you to know that. That person's not here anymore. Uh, but they told me that. I also had somebody come to the door one time and tell me something different. I said, Pastor, I like what you teach, but you always talk about people needing to know Jesus. Do you need to do that every service? And I got to be honest with you, it broke my heart. It hurt me. Not that they were offended by what I said. I don't really care what people think about what I said because I take it out of the Bible. <laughs> talk to God if you don't like it, you know. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that if you're already saved and you know Jesus, are you not interested in anybody else coming to Jesus? Is there anyone here this morning, seriously, show of hands, anyone here this morning that would say to me, Pastor, everybody in my family is saved. I'm not worried about anybody in my family. Is there anybody like that? I knew that. I knew nobody was going to raise their hands because we all have people in our family that don't know Jesus. So you have a problem? You have a struggle with somebody talking about Jesus? I got to tell you, I have relatives that are away from God and people unsaved in my life. I pray that people go get after them. So if you know Jesus this morning, praise God. And you should be excited to know that you go to a church where the gospel is still important. And you should want to share that gospel with people. If you don't know Jesus this morning, I don't want you to hear the worst words in Scripture. Depart from me. And I would ask you this morning to talk to me or talk to someone else. If you don't want to talk to me, talk to somebody else. Say, Pastor, I need to know without a doubt that when I die, I'm going to be with Jesus. Second of all, are you ready? Because you've confessed all sin. The Bible tells us that we are all sinners. When we get saved, do you remember John wrote, he said, if you say you have no sin, you are a liar. I think John knows what he's talking about. And since it's in the scripture and it's the inspired word of God, I think it's accurate. What do you all think? I think so. So that gives us a picture that even though we know Jesus as our savior, we still have sin in our life. The Bible says that even if you think something, you've already done it. Think about that. That moron. If I had a chance, I'd pop him right in the head. And I better go confess. You know what? I, I'm going to do some study and see if that counts for my dog. But anyway, um, <laughs> if we have any sin in our life, whether it's the sin of omission, where we were supposed to do something and we didn't do it, or the sin of commission, where we knew not to do it and we did it anyhow, and we haven't got that right with God, today's the day. I don't want to arrive before Jesus and have this whole list of trash with me. Are you ready for the judgment day? We're all going to stand accountable. The Bible says in Hebrews, life 
Well, in James, it says life is as a vapor. It appears for a short time and passes away. In Hebrews, it says that we have life and then we have accountability. We've got to stand before God. Jesus here talks to his disciples who he knew was not going to live through the tribulation because they're all dead. But he was giving them instructions to pass on and to teach because he wanted them to know and to share with all of us. And this morning, we share it too. I told you last week, I don't know anything in the Bible that says that Jesus couldn't come today. I was talking to a friend of mine that, was a, that is a pastor this morning, and he said to me, I just want you to know I prayed for you today. I said, thank you. I prayed for you as well. I have a whole bunch of pastor friends I pray for on Sunday mornings or Saturday nights, depending which. And he said, I was sitting on my deck this morning having my cup of coffee, and I heard this one bird start chirping. And he said, I wonder if they're warming up for the trumpet. <laughs> Perhaps today. Are you ready? You say, well, you know, I've been hearing about Jesus coming back all my life, and I haven't seen it yet. Look around you. The signs of the times, not of the rapture, but of the second coming of Christ, are very clear. And the rapture comes before the second coming. So we all better get ourselves together, get our act right, and get ready to meet Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, first and foremost, I want to pray for those people that are going to be here in the tribulation. I pray for those who are going to help the Jews because it's going to cost many of them their lives, many of them be in jail, things are going to happen. But it would be well worth it if that's what, if you were here and you chose to do that. Lord, I want to thank you for a scripture that Paul wrote where he said, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And so because of our personal relationship with you, we know that we get to be with you and that you are willing to forgive us of all if we're just faithful in coming before you and confessing our sin. Lord, this morning, speak to our hearts. If there's someone here right now that doesn't know you as Savior, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. If there's any of us here today that have unconfessed sin, we know it. We know it. I mean, it's no surprise. We know it. Lord, may we be quick and faithful in confessing our sin and turning away from it and staying away from it so we are clean with you. Lord, may we leave here this morning saying, I'm ready, perhaps today. Thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen.